Good morning, everyone. Uh, apologies for the delay. Uh, just got confused with the with GeoMeet format. Uh, now, when Hong Kong was handed over to China in 1997, uh, its people were promised that they would continue to enjoy a high degree of autonomy under the one country, two systems formula for at least 50 years. However, the Chinese government had uh, passed the national security law for Hong Kong in June of this year, uh, which grants Beijing unprecedented powers over the city. The passing of this law has led to some questions as to where is this one country, uh, two systems uh, business. Now, the Chinese action in tightening control over the island uh, city is bound to uh, affect its role as a major center of finance and trade. Their plans, I suspect, now cater to uh, what is called the incorporating Hong Kong into the Greater Bay Area again. Recently, Hong Kong Chief Executive Terry Lam uh, spoke of the need for nurturing Hong Kong students into law-abiding citizens with social responsibility and national identity. Now, study tours are going to be planned for the mainland to integrate the city, and primary and secondary school kids will be taken to uh, uh, the mainland. So, so the plan is to basically uh, integrate Hong Kong's population from virtually uh, primary school, secondary school, uh, create what they say, um, what Carrie Lam says, that encourage them to nurture their moral character and cultural identity. Uh, she has said that the central government, she claims that the central government had to intervene because of the chaos in the city, and at the same time painted the democratic opponents uh, who colluded, uh, that they were colluding with foreign powers. Now, of course, the opposition has now been neutered because they have a problem, uh, national security law around there, uh, it becomes very, very uh, difficult to function. Now, of course, in this uh, whole thing, I think the Chinese probably balanced, the, uh, balanced everything, and they realized that continuing uh, to giving in to protests in Hong Kong could well be a prelude to similar thing happening in China. So I think for them, it's a peculiar kind of a defensive move, one they're willing to, and which will impose costs on them, because Hong Kong is a finance center, I think it's probably gutted. It will impose costs on them. Uh, but at the same time, for them, the most important thing for the Communist Party of China is uh, security of the party's rule uh, in China. So I think they're, will, they're willing to pay the cost. In any case, now uh, we will, uh, we will uh, begin this uh, webinar with uh, Arshi Tirke uh, taking us through the Hong Kong national security law and implications for India. So, okay, Arshi. Uh, thank you, sir. So, Nandini and I started working on this paper soon after the national security law was announced in June. Uh, this was a dramatic development for the region that had been witnessing widespread protests for well over a year. And the reason for uh, the protest was a controversial extradition bill that was announced in 2019. So the national security law itself, um, the announced the announcement received a widespread media coverage, uh, mostly because there were questions about what this law would mean for Hong Kong's autonomy and human rights protection in the region. Uh, the extraterritorial reach of the law uh, uh, invited criticism from foreign countries. Um, and also there were questions about what this law would eventually mean for Hong Kong's status as a global trade and financial center. So the law was announced on 28 June. The reasons that were given by China for this particular law was that it was important to safeguard the long-term prosperity, stability, and also uphold the national sovereignty, security, and development interest of Hong Kong. And there were also concerns about social unrest and street violence in Hong Kong. And China also said that it was suspicious of activities of Hong Kong independence organizations, violent radicals, as well as interference by external forces. So while this was the narrative that was pushed forward by China, um, many believe that the law's true target was peaceful dissent, as well as Hong Kong's autonomy. Because once the law was enacted, there were many arrests under this particular law, um, including one high-profile arrest of Mr. Jimmy Lai, who, is the, who was the owner of a major pro-democracy paper in Hong Kong called Apple Daily. 
So to sort of understand the implication of this law, it's important to look at the one country, two systems principle, which allows Hong Kong to uh, retain a different legal, political, and economic system from China. This policy was formulated in 1982. Um, it's primarily based on three uh, legal instruments. The first is the 1984 Sino-British Joint Declaration. So Hong Kong was a port city of the British Empire for around 200 years. And through this treaty, the British handed over Hong Kong back to China. Now, given that uh, Hong Kong was under British rule for so long, uh, it developed a different um, society, culture, legal system, tradition that was separate from the mainland. So this treaty sort of uh, sought to protect uh, Hong Kong's autonomy and recognize like, the coexistence of these two systems within one country. So the treaty sought to retain Hong Kong's way of life, common law legal system, uh, capitalist economy. Um, it specifically said that except for national defense and foreign affairs, Hong Kong would exercise a wide range of autonomy in finance, economy, trade, and development. This is why Hong Kong has its own currency, its own flag, um, it issues its own passports, and uh, this special status is guaranteed for 50 years starting from 1997. Um, apart from this, uh, China's own constitution, as well as the basic law, which is Hong Kong's mini constitution, they also sort of uh, protect this autonomy and Hong Kong's ability to exercise its own executive, legislative, and independent judicial power. So the significance of this principle lies in the fact that Hong Kong retains its different system from China. Um, it, en it enjoys a limited democracy. Um, it has an independent judiciary, which is kind of crucial in safeguarding certain rights and guarantees which are not sufficiently prote protected in China's courts. This includes the freedom of speech, expression, protection from arbitrary arrests, and uh, it also helps secure Hong Kong's free economy as well as um, uh, protect uh, as, a, as well as support uh, efforts to fight corruption because it helps guarantee public disclosure, um, access to go government information, so on and so forth. So what the national security law does is um, there are four aspects to to sort of uh, uh, look at this. Um, it introduces four new crimes or offenses. Uh, which is secession, subversion, terrorist, terrorism, and collusion with foreign forces. Uh, so these offenses are defined very broadly, which can lead to arbitrary interpretation. Uh, for instance, uh, these offenses can also cast criminal liability mm -hmm. for acts which don't necessarily lead to or incite a violent overthrow of the government. So this can mean that, uh, for instance, say your tweets, um, your social media posts, uh, academic discussions, even if none of these say you know, incite a violent overthrow of the government, you could still be held criminal, criminally liable for these offenses. Um, Chinese courts, uh, there have been cases in China's courts where uh, someone who criticized China's government on the internet was held liable for subversion, even if this act did not uh, incite violence. So there is, uh, there is that example. Uh, the second is national security governance. The law sets up uh, different structures to enforce national security within Hong Kong. And to varying degrees, these are directly or indirectly under China's control. Uh, they are under the supervision of the central people's government, which is China's chief administrative authority. And they also exercise a degree of control over appointments to uh, these uh, enforcement structures. Uh, the third is jurisdiction. Uh, jurisdiction. Hong Kong uh, courts exercise jurisdiction over offenses under this law, um, except for cases where foreign elements are involved or where Hong Kong is unable to enforce the national security law or where there is a threat to national security. Uh, in these cases, the trial will go to China's courts. Um, the fourth aspect is the extraterritorial application. So this is what gives the law a wide reach. Um, so apart from uh, the law applying to offenses committed within Hong Kong or by permanent residents and entities of Hong Kong, 
It also covers offenses committed by non-permanent residents from outside Hong Kong. So hypothetically, say if a Canadian citizen um, says anything to support the Hong Kong democracy movement or the uh, independence movement, uh, they could in principle be arrested if they travel through Hong Kong. So this is uh, not the first time that a national security law was debated for, for this region. Uh, in 2002, there were efforts to uh, enact a similar law. Uh, this was undertaken by the Hong Kong government and all the Chinese government. And there was a lot of pushback under uh, against that draft bill. So when the draft bill was being considered for uh, consultations, uh, many uh, uh, sections of the society registered their concerns. Business houses specifically said that uh, such a law could inhibit public disclosure of information and uh, indirectly affect their businesses. And uh, eventually there were protests and that particular draft bill from 2002 was dropped. But uh, what is interesting for this present law, which was enacted in 2022, uh, 2020, sorry, uh, is that uh, this was not even uh, considered in consultations. The draft was not published before being enacted, and the people only saw the law once it was enacted. So the international response has been fairly uh, critical. Uh, specifically because of the extraterritorial reach and its uh, possible impact on foreign trade, businesses, diaspora, expatriate communities, tourists and international students. So various countries such as the United Kingdom, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and Germany, um, they sort of responded to, to this law through uh, four distinct ways. Uh, one was to suspend or terminate their extradition treaties so that anyone who could be liable under the law would not be extradited to Hong Kong or, uh, yeah. And the second one was uh, issuing travel advisories to citizens to exercise caution when they were traveling to Hong Kong. Third was prohibiting exports of dual use goods and technology. And lastly, the relaxation of visa and immigration mm -hmm. rules to allow the people of Hong Kong to move to their own countries. So moving on to um, implications for India, there are uh, two aspects to consider here. One is that um, India has an extradition treaty with Hong Kong, but not with China. So there's obviously a question about uh, uh, if someone was say extradited to Hong Kong, um, they could, under this law, they could be sent to China for trials. So that's, that's one sort of a loophole that has now been created. Um, the second is that Hong Kong is home to a large Indian community, Indian professionals and students. So there is obviously uh, an interest for India to protect this particular community. So India could consider if it wants to alter its visa, migration or residence policies for Indian nationals traveling to Hong Kong. And and, uh, because there's a possibility that they could be exposed to arrest if they travel through Hong Kong. Um, India could also re-examine its extradition arrangements in line with reasoning adopted by other countries. However, it is important to note that these treaties do not allow for extradition of Indian citizens and contain exemptions for political offenses. Um, however, for uh, individuals who are not Indian citizens, uh, these protections would not be available. So for instance, say uh, Dharamshala, which is home to several Tibetan refugees, um, they could face the prospect of extradition if they directly or indirectly make references to Hong Kong's autonomy. Um, they are obviously protected under the Refugee Convention, but India is not a party to that convention. So this is, this is like a theoretical um, loophole that could exist. Um, so, but anyway, this connection could be difficult to establish and extradition remains a largely political decision and could eventually be refused by India. So the next section looks at trade investment for which I'll ask Nandini to take over. Okay, Nandini. <laughs> Thank you, Ashi. Now I'll speak about the possible economic implications of the passage of the NSL. Um, the law, as Ashi's already mentioned, will not only apply to people, but it will also apply to companies and for crimes that are not just com committed within, but also outside of Hong Kong. 
uh, financial gains may be confiscated and licenses revoked if uh, they're found uh, violating the terms of the law. Uh, in the 2002 consultation, uh, business organizations had wanted that the government would first issue a white paper, which would have a similar text as the actual law. But uh, as we know, this time uh, the text of the new law was kept secret and it was made public only after the law was passed. So uh, the passage of the law has definitely impacted the um, sentiments of the business community. Uh, according to a survey by the American Chamber of Commerce, 80% expressed concerns over the new law and 60% feel that it will impact their business. Um, Hong Kong's position as uh, the financial capital of the world uh, rests on a stable political system and free capital movement. Um, as a result of this passage of the um, law, uh, Hong Kong's score in the Index of Economic Freedom 2020 has been downgraded for the first time in 20 years to second place and has been replaced with uh, Singapore. Uh, financial flows have already started favoring Singapore. Mm -hmm. In terms of trade, um, uh, Hong Kong is the largest uh, re-exporting country in the world, with more than 75% of its imports re-exported. Uh, Ashi, can you change the slide to the next one? Thank you. Um, as you can see from this graph, most of the, um, today China is the largest uh, market for um, Hong Kong, and uh, 50, more than 50% of the re-exports uh, goes to China. Uh, next slide. Uh, Uh, US, um, US is one of the countries which has taken economic measures ag uh, against Hong Kong. Uh, it has amended the United States Hong Kong Policy Act of, um, of 1992. This basically allowed USA to uh, treat Hong Kong independently in terms of trade and economic affairs. Uh, as a result of the um, which would basically mean that the trade um, measures that were taken against China since 2018 will now apply to Hong Kong as well. With uh, regard to 2018 trade war itself, uh, already the trade with Hong Kong uh, was affected. As you can see from the table, uh, from 2018, uh, the exports to the US by Hong Kong was affected and had declined. So this will likely be further impacted because of the imposition of the new tariffs. Um, U.S. is one of the largest um, trade um, trade partners of India, and Hong Kong is also a destination of free exports for Indian goods to the global market. So global tensions due to political unrest in Hong Kong has consequences for trade for India with the rest of the world, as well as with China. India's re-exports have grown at the rate of 11.5% from 2014, and it, Hong Kong is the fourth largest export market for India. Uh, so uh, the U.S.-China uh, trade war since 2018, that has also re resulted in a significant worsening of the trade balance with Hong Kong. As you can see from the graph, 2018 and 2019, this, 2018 was the first time when the trade surplus with Hong Kong uh, turned into a trade deficit. Hong Kong, in terms of imports, jumped to the sixth position in 2019 as compared to 13th uh, in 2016. Uh, as a result of the uh, trade war, China has been looking for newer markets and this increase in imports could be uh, a possible reason would be because of rerouting of exports via Hong Kong. Uh, now the with further imposition of um, tariffs on Hong Kong this this is likely to increase in the future and that has led Indian authorities to put uh, imports from Hong Kong under greater scrutiny. India has taken economic measures. Uh, the relations between India and Hong Kong uh, trade relations are also impacted by the larger relation that India has with China. And India has taken economic measures against uh, China because of the ongoing political tensions. Uh, recently, it also changed the FDI rules, which also apply to Hong Kong. And um, the direct investments from Hong Kong since uh, 2000 is almost double that of China. So a lot of the investment that comes in from China is also diluted through Hong Kong. Uh, the ongoing tensions, um, the global tensions between Hong Kong and China and the rest of the world does provide an opportunity for the Indian uh, policymakers to try and attract the business, businesses that are trying to diversify out of Hong Kong. 
uh, although uh, the beneficiaries so far have been Southeast Asian countries. Uh, Hong Kong uh, also provides a healthy ecosystem for startups and they pre present a good base to gain access to the Chinese economy. Uh, but the situation right now would be uh, of wait and watch to see how the situation in, uh, unfolds uh, to really uh, gauge what the long term impacts on businesses would be. Thank you. I think uh, we've had a fairly comprehensive uh, and uh, balanced kind of two presentations. One is focused on the legal aspects, the second one on the economic aspects. And okay. now we have, uh, I, we'll have some comments. Uh, from two senior people uh, uh, who are uh, participating. So I think um, we can uh, start with uh, Professor Bhalla. Uh, I think uh, Manoj, uh, Arshi still has one more slide to present. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just briefly go through it. I won't share the slide. Um, so in conclusion, um, while there was a lot of uh, attention, because there was a lot of attention on this development, um, before the human, UN Human Rights Council, 53 states voiced their support for the Chinese law, um, while 27 countries led by the UK criticized it. So India did not join either statement, but uh, said that it was watching developments closely since a large Indian community lives there and hoped that relevant parties will consider the issues raised and address them properly, seriously, and objectively. So this is a departure from past practice for New Delhi, which has remained silent on the Hong Kong protests for over, over the years. And India's uh, statement is likely a consequence of the ongoing tensions with China. However, it is important to note that if India aims, uh, chooses to change any of its policies, say, say its legal cooperation with Hong Kong or its visa rules, um, any changes to India's Hong Kong policy would definitely make an impact on its China policy. And we would say that since the full implications of the national security law is yet to be understood, um, India should carefully follow the developments in the region before uh, making any changes to its policy. Um, thank you. Back to you, sir. Uh, so uh, I think I, I, I made some uh, remarks earlier that we have this uh, these two presentations here. I also uh, uh, have been a bit scatterbrained today that I didn't introduce the two speakers, meaning uh, we have uh, Arshi, uh, who basically uh, looks at international law. She's a junior fellow in uh, ORF, and she's a specialist in international law. Got an LLM from Singapore and um, BALLB from the National Law Institute. And we have uh, Nandini, uh, who's uh, from the uh, Green Transitions uh, Initiative, uh, and she looks at growth, trade, uh, etc., you know, uh, and climate uh, issues. So I, I think that introduction done, then I will go on to Professor Bhalla uh, to make her comments on this. Um, thanks for that presentation. So uh, just a few things. I, I just wanted to sort of uh, put a few questions out there. One is why has the Chinese Communist Party decided to do this in Hong Kong now? Uh, it has faced dissidents in Hong Kong previously. Um, and uh, it has also, in fact, uh, uh, at times, soft peddled its attitude towards the citizens in Hong Kong. Because it's been in the last few years that has enabled Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party to take fairly extreme steps with the National Security Act in Hong Kong in this year alone. That's one question. And I think a backdrop to that would be interesting to see because actually many, many events in the last couple of years have led up to this very, uh, very uh, almost authoritarian, well, very authoritarian position in Hong Kong. Uh, the first, of course, has been what it has done in Xinjiang, for example, the implication of, uh, uh, of new policies in Xinjiang, which have basically created a concentration camp out of that state, uh, out of that province. And the fact that the West or no country, uh, no important country globally has actually stood up and castigated China for that. So human rights has not been on the agenda for the global community for quite some time, specifically in relation to China. 
secondly, I think what has happened also is that within the Chinese Communist Party, the concentration of power to Xi Jinping has also indicated that uh, it's really a, all the solutions to stability, to governance, etc., are going to be technocratic and somewhat brutalistically technocratic. So essentially, the line of action has was set with she consolidating power and with she actually consolidating his hold on governance in China. So in very many ways, I think, if you look at Xi's document on governance in China, much of what is happening in Hong Kong actually emerges from that kind of thinking, that framework of thinking. Uh, uh, and the second question I think that comes up is, uh, why is China willing to accept the financial uh, financial um, costs of doing what it has done in Hong Kong? Uh, and thirdly, uh, why have the Hong Kong dissidents at this moment, between 2019 and 2020, mounted the kind of dissidents and the kind of movement that they have mounted in Hong Kong? Uh, I think the second question on China willing to take the financial costs of its actions in Hong Kong, and there are going to be very clear financial costs. A lot of the, um, I think the foreign investment is now going moving into Singapore, for example. Uh, a lot of countries are looking at whether their companies should be functioning. If companies are look, look, looking at whether they should be functioning out of Hong Kong with the implications of the National Security Act for their employees. Um, and uh, to a large extent, I think the idea that uh, governance in Hong Kong is going to be now under the aegis of Beijing is scaring off many, many investors. So uh, why is China prepared to accept that? Partly because uh, in some ways, I think the Hong Kong economy has not done as well as the mainland economy. Secondly, I think because the economic, the, uh, economic policy framework is now being completely decided by Beijing rather than by its provinces. So in a sense, I think the uh, consolidation of economic policy making and the economic policy framework from Beijing, um, in a sense, marginalizes Hong Kong per se, Hong Kong's economy per se. And thirdly, it seems to me that the dissidents have mounted this huge attack on the, on the Chinese government the last few years because of the impending consequences of 2047. That would be the end of the one country, two systems framework. That would have been the end of the one country, two systems framework. And essentially uh, looking to change the possibilities of the end of that one country, two systems framework. And they have obviously failed. The, the, the uh, application of the National Security Act, they have actually failed because the National Security Act has now essentially undone the one country, two systems a framework completely by putting Hong Kong's governance under the aegis of Beijing. And specifically, as you noted, Ashi, uh, by putting its judicial processes under the aegis of uh, the judicial institutions that have their get their authority from Beijing. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether, you know, if you cast your presentation um, in a sort of wider uh, frame, uh, you get some more answers about the rationality of China's approach to this entire issue. And that's really broadly what I have to say. Thank you, uh, Professor Bhalla. And uh, I think that uh, Professor Bhalla made some important larger points, meaning an overview uh, what is happening in China uh, itself. Uh, so in that sense, Hong Kong is a subset of things happening within China. So sometimes we tend to look at look at issues from the external thing in the sense that, you know, how uh, external issues are affecting Hong Kong. But sometimes these are pressures which come from developments within. And China, as you know, is quite an opaque place. I mean, so we've got to make sense out of a out of, um, number of things happening uh, out there. Uh, but now we have um, uh, my friend Pramit uh, Paul Chaudhary. Uh, who is a foreign editor of uh, the Hindustan Times and also um, a distinguished fellow with Aspen uh, Institute. So, Pramit? Sure. Um, so, I think, yes, I, I, <clears throat> the paper I thought brought out very nicely the, the slow, uh, well, very rapid evolution of China's response to Hong Kong's dissident movement and the slow 
uh, reduction, if you wish, of that movement and the quite blatant uh, moves to eradicate uh, any serious or genuine autonomy uh, within Hong Kong. Um, as, as Dr. Bal has mentioned, the last real vestige of that now is the judiciary. And I think there was an article recently in the Financial Times about how the Chinese system is beginning the process uh, of slowly uh, eradicating that as well. Um, it'll be interesting to note the question, I th perhaps one of the number of questions that arise is one, why did the government, Chinese government actually go to the bother to jump through these hoops of actually passing laws? Um, because ultimately, China is not really a nation that follows uh, the, the rule of law. And I think one of the key reasons was the judiciary that they needed to, they felt they needed that since that was still independent enough and functional, they had to at least uh, go through the motions of passing some sort of a law uh, that would do this. Otherwise, uh, a, lot of, a lot of what they've done in other parts, uh, notably in Xinjiang and others, they haven't even actually bothered too much uh, on the legal process in carrying out action that's just been party rules and regulations and diktats. Um, I, I would argue, I mean, my sense has been always that the Chinese have, can you say, different levels of autonomy or dual systems, if you wish, within their larger concept of greater China. Um, as mentioned earlier, you have Tibet, Xinjiang, and to some degree Manchuria, the Mongol uh, uh, areas uh, in Inner Mongolia, where Outer Mongolia, where you see uh, uh, there was at one point a degree of cultural autonomy and virtually nothing else was allowed. Even that is now being slowly shut down, definitely in Xinjiang, where there's been a deliberate move to basically eradicate uh, the existing uh, Turkic culture. Uh, but now, for some reason, they've also gone after the Mongols, which are, which are the, the Manchu, uh, the culture that's there, even though that's not traditionally something that's been a major concern for the Chinese. And we all know what's happened and has been happening on the Tibetan side for, for quite some time. Um, but the other three, there were three, always three parts to the two China, one China, two systems uh, story. Uh, one was obviously Hong Kong, where it was the greatest degree of autonomy um, in so far as a, a territory that had Chinese sovereignty, but did not uh, necessarily have to obey China on almost everything else, except uh, through this indirect political control that they maintained. And now, as we can see, they're slowly uh, reducing that dramatically. Uh, I presume that the fact that the least, latest dissident actions developed a degree of mass support that they've never seen before is what alarmed them, but there are probably other reasons. The other part, the other territory which people often forget is Macau. Uh, Macau has a very similar treaty understanding between Portugal and the Chinese, but Macau never developed during the Portuguese colonial period a degree, a sense of independence from China and autonomy that happened because Macau was economically completely dependent for food, water and everything uh, for its survival, <clears throat> unlike Hong Kong, on the Chinese mainland. So they had always, the Portuguese had always, and the people of Macau, had always understood that they sort of survived at the whim if you wish, of China. So they never developed a political culture of independence. And Macau, you'll notice, had absolutely no protests or demonstrations in support uh, of what was happening in the, quote, sister city of Hong Kong. Uh, what I found even more interesting is that Xi Jinping and other Chinese leaders have pointed to Macau and said Macau is what the future of the one China, two systems should be. Hong Kong and other parts should look at Macau as the model. Uh, and Macau has a certain degree of financial independence. It has its own monetary authority or central bank. Um, and it has its own currency, which I think the Indians have always been in the source of amusement because it's called the Pataka. Um, and there, uh, but other than that, it basically seizes at that point. Everything else is basically dictated uh, by by chain. And if what she and others have said is that this is where we want Hong Kong to go, in effect, I think that was a clear signaling. And they'll notice that you may have noticed that they have said that the patriotic educational system of Macau is again the reason why Macauans are not becoming problem makers like Hong Kong. So I think Macau in many ways is going to be interesting to see as a model for where Hong Kong, China wants to take Hong Kong. 
Finally, of course, the last one China two systems area is one where China does not actually exercise any sovereignty, which is Taiwan. And I think it's very important to always keep how Taiwan fits into this, because in many ways, the reason why they allowed Deng Xiaoping, allowed Hong Kong the degree of authority or autonomy that he had, was with an eye to slowly bringing Taiwan into the picture. Very clearly now, they just assume that that's the Taiwanese are never going to come voluntarily. And so the language now on Taiwan is much more about forcible closure. So I just start putting that, trying to put a lot of this, trying to put the Hong Kong thing to some degree in perspective. And while there are obviously local pressures as to why the Chinese government decided to do what it did, as I said, this, the mass the size of the, the, the dissent, the size of the mass support to the, the dissent movement, to the pro-democracy movement received was a major concern. But I would argue it also fits in with a larger Chinese pattern, mainland pattern, that this entire idea of two, two systems uh, really doesn't make any sense unless it's something very similar to Macau. And then even the degrees, minor degrees of cultural autonomy that are allowed on the mainland are now slowly being extinguished it most notably in a place like uh, like Xinjiang. Um, I'll just mention a little bit about the, the economics. Um, and I think if you've seen the fact that the Chinese government um, has over time systematically reduced Hong Kong's stature as the financial center for the, for the greater Chinese area in favor of Shanghai. Um, and, and that's been a systematic slow burn process. Um, over the past uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, one, that's key, one key reason why I think Hong Kong matters less to them. But I think the second reason is important is that the Chinese political economy, if you look at what the Chinese government now says, is simply that we do not need external capital to the degree we used to in the past to sustain the growth levels of China. In which case, Hong Kong's um, utility, if you wish, is much reduced. And finally, the anti-corruption movement of Xi Jinping, one of the key reasons Hong Kong survived was because it was used by Chinese party leaders to salt away their own money. Um, and now, uh, under Xi at least, he's not interested in allowing that, arguably because he sees that as a source of, of dissent, a source of, of funding for dissent against him. Um, but I will point to the, uh, uh, the, the recent Chinese, very arbitrary Chinese government's move to stop the IPO by the Ant Group, uh, Jack, Ma's, uh, uh, Jack Ma's holding company, uh, as, an, as an indication that China is not even interested in importing Hong Kong degrees of financial autonomy or, or rules to the mainland, but quite the opposite, and they're going to rapidly increase or continue to increase the degree of Chinese political control over their economy and the space for both the private sector and, and independent financial markets will just continue to be reduced. Um, so again, Hong Kong doesn't really matter that much. And finally, of course, for India, I think it's pretty clear the Indian government is now treating Hong Kong pretty much as other, most other at least Western governments are, treating Hong Kong on par with the mainland China. And I think the real game is going to, I remember the paper you'd written mentioned specific case of China Light and Power, CLP, CLP is a perfect example of the problem that that, that, will, that will now, or the, the, the difficulties we'll have to work out this. CLP is a company based in Hong Kong, owned by a non-Chinese family, uh, the Jews in fact, um, and its ownership is almost completely Western, yet it is going to be treated on par as any other Hong Kong Chinese company uh, is there. So this is going to make the India-Hong Kong financial and economic relationship increasingly difficult as the Indian government will perforce, I think, have to treat Hong Kong as exactly the same as it treats mainland China. And as we know, its treatment of mainland China economic now is extremely hostile. I'll end there. Thank you, uh, Pramit. Uh, thank you, because you've given us a kind of a um, uh, view from around, and which includes Macau, meaning if we can, uh, as a kind of a peculiar uh, territory. Uh, I think the Hong Kong story is uh, a continuing story. And uh, one or two things I might, I, I may wonder, see, 
the the Chinese accused Western countries of interfering in Hong Kong. That's quite possible, meaning that's not a, meaning if you look at the color revolutions, et cetera, et cetera, that's quite possible. But the point was not that. The point I'm trying to make is that was there an element of overreach by the democratic movement? Because uh, knowing China, uh, what else did you expect? Meaning if you reach the point where, uh, where um, uh, the uh, authority of China is questioned, so I think that there was uh, the, 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 uh, the protesters and democratic protesters, they kind of lost control in the sense, I don't think they had any, frankly, I don't think they had any kind of uh, uh, guidance from anyone because had they had guidance, it would have been more strategically uh, uh, played out. But the fact that it played out the way it did meant that it was just a kind of an upsurge that kind of went out of control and it gave China the opportunity uh, to pass this law. Of course, it coincided with a phase in China of uh, greater, as uh, Pramit is saying, greater uh, assertion of party control. And China is in a peculiar position where on one hand, it is trying to encourage the private sector. Okay, they are, they are, uh, at least if you look at it from the point of view of slogans, and et cetera. On the other hand, you know, as of the past couple of years, uh, they have insisted that party committees be formulated uh, within private sector companies, and which creates a problem. Meaning, meaning in China, you know, there's a fiction. I mean, you have the parallel party and you have the parallel government. That's why you have two central military commissions, but they are identical persons. So, so, so these kind of paradoxes uh, we have to live with in trying to understand and comprehend this. And um, I think that uh, you have uh, already a good paper. Suggestions have been made by Professor Bhalla um, and uh, Pramit. Maybe you'd like to uh, incorporate that. And I must say, while uh, referring to Professor Bhalla, she's also the uh, editor of India Quarterly. So she could she would be game to have a look at your paper if you wanted to have it published uh, <laughs> externally. And uh, so I'll uh, stop here and see if there are any uh, questions uh, from anyone or uh, any more suggestions we are still uh, we'll still be open i just wanted to say that i think what pramit said about macau was really uh, uh, you know very significant because at the height of the dissidents movement in hong kong uh, <clears throat> There was a major meeting in Macau uh, to which she didn't. And Macau is the way to go for the two country, uh, for the one country, two systems, uh, you know, framework. And this is a model one country, two systems kind of example. Um, and uh, the uh, what he also stressed was that uh, as part of the one country, two systems framework. What was really important was a focus on patriotism, right? And he actually went to a school in Macau where the school children then sort of talked about patriotism, and so did she talk about patriotism. And patriotism has become a key factor in Xi's own ideology in the mainland, where, uh, you know, the uh, laws against uh, the national security laws, the national security uh, framework and the, the governance actually militates against dissidents, unpatriotic elements, as well as other, you know, criminalized uh, tendencies. So patriotism has become a major focus of Xi's ideology and his and is embedded in his notion of the socialist development of China. So it's, uh, it's he sort of, uh, you know, uh, he's, um, what shall I say, so one of the things that uh, is significant in was significant for him at least for uh, Beijing in the dissidents uh, movement in uh, Hong Kong was the fact was the assumption that foreign powers were actually meddling in China's domestic affairs and that uh, Chinese dissidents in Hong, uh, Hong Kong dissidents were not patriotic enough in terms of their allegiance to the mainland. Um, now, this has become a sort of running theme, as I said, within Xi's um, uh, pronouns in China. And this has also become, become a running theme in social media in China. 
So in a, in a way, it sort of uh, creates broader um, affinities uh, within China with the state and also creates a lot of criticism of the dissidents movement from mainland China. I mean, it's very interesting that on social media in mainland China, there was absolutely no support for the Hong Kong dissident movement. Um, and the, the pronouncements on that dissident movement were really extremely harsh and quite brutal. Uh, this is something that you haven't actually seen before when dissenting movements have occurred, say, across China in even sporadic ways. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's very interesting to see how, uh, she's, um, how she has actually coalesced all of the nationalistic, patriotic, uh, uh, you know, uh, affiliations to protest, to have uh, citizens in China protest dissidents in Hong Kong. Uh, this is, you know, this is something we have not seen in social media in China before. And this is this is a new phase of patriotic nationalism in China that brooks no um, criticism of the Chinese state of Chinese culture, of the Chinese state, of China's history, civilization, whatever you want to call it. Right. What uh, I referred to that, you know, Carrie Lam saying that uh, there must be from uh, primary and secondary school kids are now going to be taken to the mainland, uh, right. those of patriotism. So I think uh, Prabit would make any remarks right now, then I can get Arshi and Nandini to comment uh, at the end. I think go ahead, go 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 directly to them. Pardon? Uh, go ahead. Let uh, let Arshi and Nandini speak. Okay, okay, okay. So um, Arshi, would you like to respond to anything? Yes. Um, uh, thank you so much for uh, the comments from from the panel, um, uh, especially the comparison to Macau's national security law and. And you know, having like this sort of comparative analysis of how the one country, two system principle is uh, is there with these different regions obviously helps. But there's also like a very political aspect about how China views Hong Kong, and and uh, I think that that's what we wanted to look at the look at in this paper. So there's definitely scope for more research on this in 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 terms of looking at how this principle has evolved and what the national security law will eventually. Uh, be implemented or how it's enforced. So, so yeah. Uh, Nandini, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to say thank you for the comments. And I've also learned uh, new things uh, from the comments, and I will go back and do some more reading on that. And maybe we can think about uh, modifying and adding more to our paper. Thank you. Pramit, you want to say something? Um, no, I think uh, more or less. I think we've we've gone and we've done uh, provided. I think everybody has provided some context, if you wish, to the national security law. Uh, and I think the only thing that that's really lacking, if you wish, or or either for fur further studies or for future for an expansion of the papers to provide context. Uh, we've all mentioned an example of Macau. And I think perhaps some understanding of the political motives of, or as much as we can understand the political motives of Beijing in treating the Hong Kong, the present Hong Kong pro-democracy movement in a much harsher manner um, than, uh, than it has before. Well, I, uh, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that, you know, also I just recollect that recently a lot of uh, legislators were disqualified or they were not allowed to participate in the elections. So I think you can also, uh, and this was because of the national security law. I mean, they, they invoked that law uh, in such a way that those people were forced to back off. So I think that also you may like to uh, include. So I think we'll conclude here and thank everyone. Thank Professor Bhalla, uh, Pramit, uh, and uh, Nandini and Arshi, I think you have uh, some little more work which you can uh, incorporate into your uh, paper. And uh, so, okay, I'll uh, close the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.